Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part two of our discussion of The Voluntary City. And in this episode, we talk about the potential for voluntary urban land use planning. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. I would like to, uh, I'd like to just um, ask about a couple of the ideas that, um, that, that are raised in, in the book that, um, that you edited, Peter. Um, I think they're very, very relevant to sort of the discussion that we're having about urbanism now um, and especially because you know they just are not I think not very well known and, and I found it very interesting to read about um, and, and the, really the ideas that, that this book uh, that I found really interesting in this book are especially the market processes that deliver all of the things that we traditionally see as being state you know, uh, areas of market failure and, and things that the state must must do. So, for example, just in terms of urban planning itself, in terms of land use planning, in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, organisation of uses and um, provision of access to plots and so forth, people often assume that um, if, there was, if there wasn't a local plan, then, you know, you you might buy a property and it might just get hemmed in by the surrounding properties and that nobody would look after the the common areas of road and that um, you know that everything would sort of fall apart and in the book you know the there's a really nice discussion of how in the absence of local plans through contracts all of those problems were solved by using covenants so as far as i understand the you know and they are of course still still used but there is a long history, especially in urbanisation in, in England, because England ur- urbanised so quick, so much earlier than a lot of other places, that um, you know, many of these problems that we assume are sort of problems for, for a planning authority to solve are, have been solved um, and can be solved through, through voluntary processes. Is that, um, is, that my, is that sort of the way that you see it in terms of the, uh. this? Um, I think so. Well, I, I think so. And, um, you know, the uh, I, I'm sure you looked at the Stephen Davies uh, chapter. St- Stephen Davies chapter is pretty much an English history chapter or English history as far as cities go. And uh, he makes your point that there was substantial, um, uh, substantial and pretty decent urbanization going on before we ever had the urban planning uh, superstructure that we now have. And people don't recognize. In fact, people presume that all we had were, you know, bad old days with with grand market failure. But but even today, um, I think, you know, for for example, the um, uh, International Council for Shopping Centers, I think they're called ICSC, uh, they put out various statistics, and they say in the U.S. there are 105,000 privately owned shopping centers and some of those are the big malls and some of those are the, what they call the lifestyle centers and so on and so forth. Um, and that's about half all of all the retail space in America and that can be urban as well as suburban. But those are chunks of land of uh, varying size where the land use planning is essentially private. I mean, when you own a shopping center, then it's your business, uh, it's in your interest to arrange the land use design and the land use allocation in a way that works. And so even though even though these are not necessarily these are in the context these are in context of traditional cities, uh, they are privately planned and they come in all sizes. And the same thing goes for industrial parks and the same thing goes for um, Bob Nelson now says that uh, I forget he has a he has a, he has a Bob Nel- Robert Nelson has a book that came out after the Voluntary City he has a chapter in the Voluntary City, but he has a book out that some people may have seen, and he tracks these things and he says you know a good chunk of uh, modern residential development is uh, via homeowner associations where the governance comes via the market. And people may have seen there is um, uh, what is the fellow's name? There, there is um, there's a fellow who goes around and debates Bob Nelson, and I can't think of his name at the moment, but he's he's a well known guy. And um, there, 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 there's a podcast by these two from I think Mercatus 
a few weeks ago. You guys can look it up. And what's so interesting were the areas of agreement. The uh, critic of private communities, as well as the people that loves to promote private communities. Right. Uh, continuing on uh, Bob Nelson's chapter. Yes. Yes. Um, he does talk a little bit about how these private communities could work in inner cities as well. Absolutely. As he uh, seems to think that they would be most useful in uh, some sort of gated community type form. And that seems to me to be a little at odds with um, Jane Jacobs' uh, work that suggests that neighborhoods need to attract outsiders um, to to be vital um, sure. and and stay healthy. Um, sure. So it, it seems uh, that there's kind of an inherent contradiction there between the private community and her view of uh, a strong neighborhood. Um, could you comment on, on that? Do you agree? Well, I'm, not, well I, I'm not sure it has to be gated. I mean, I, I know I think one of Bob's uh, really interesting ideas is how you can privatize inner city neighborhoods. But I don't think he wants to put gates around them. I think that um, he is a, he is a fan of privatization. I don't know if you've been down in New Orleans after the the storm after Katrina, and I think um, there there's been a lot written about New Orleans. And of course, the the interesting stuff is how people spontaneously came together in spite of what was going down, what's going on top down. And I think there's been a lot of publicity. Well, let me back up a little bit. The, um, the, the, the storm essentially wiped out a lot of things, wiped out one of the worst school districts, public school districts we had in America. And because of this, because of this exogenous event, wiping out this school district, the legislature had no choice practically but to allow charter schools to form. And charter schools are an example of a bunch of institutions uh, I think I think the woman's name is um, Chalmers Wright. Uh, is it Emily Chalmers Wright? I'm not sure. Anyway, Ch- she's written Chamley. a. Sorry. Chamley Wright. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, um, I think what is so interesting. I, I I was down there a couple times after the storm, and um, you know, in in the U.S. Um, el- during election times, people put these, uh, stick these signs in the ground in their front lawns, you know, support candidates so-and-so. I think some of you have seen those all over the place. And when I was in New Orleans, you saw sort of spontaneous signs going up, call this number if you want to join this charter school. And charter schools were being formed right and left, because, which was a bottom-up uh, situation as far as I can tell. And I think they've gotten some good press in the national press in terms of how they're outperforming the conventional public schools. So, you know, it needn't be things with gates around them, but I think uh, sort of the Chalmers right view, which is very consistent with Voluntary City, is give people the chance, or at least, you know, give them this horrible impetus of this horrible storm, and people will be inventive and form institutions uh, in a, on a very practical basis, which have nothing to do with the kind of things that might be coming out, out of City Hall. Out of City Hall, they appointed a guy who was going to be a redevelopment czar. And I hate that word czar anyway, but these politicians love it. I think the, the redevelopment czar has come and gone without having done too much damage, certainly didn't, certainly didn't do any good. But I think that uh, the the instinct is typically... What can we do in a very conventional way? And that's, you know, politicians are going to be politicians. But other things happen under their very noses. And I think the things that happen under their very noses, even without um, top-down prompted reform, is very interesting stuff. And I think if there were a voluntary city, you know, volume two, then I think we'd probably start with, with the events in New Orleans. Great. Thanks. I, uh, Stephen, I'd like to say something. Um I, I'm not sure if this is what Emily was getting at, but when I think of, you know, gated communities, I guess one of the reasons it's it's so much easier to have these in the suburbs is that, you know, you, you can actually, people are actually relatively far away from each other, whereas in a city, you know, if you try to, if you had, you know, a gated community, you know, very soon people start 
complaining, you know, you can't, you can't sneak in a skyscraper in New York City. Um, so I just, I, I wonder if, you know, maybe there is something about, you know, our political structure that makes it so much easier to, to be free in the, you know, away from the city. You know, if there's something about a city that kind of precludes, um, you know, that sort of, you know, cessation or, you know, anything like that. Well, I think we have choices, and we have more, more choices than ever. And I think that, uh, but 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 let, let me go back to the gated point. Most private communities in America are not gated, and I, I think that there there are a bunch. Yes, there are a bunch of high end ones that are gated, and I think a lot of people um, have reservations around those about those. But I think there's a whole lot that's going on in the way of private governance, which doesn't necessarily mean gates around it. Now, what goes on in cities or what goes on in the in the old-fashioned or the old-time core cities is perhaps a, a much bigger challenge, I agree with you. And I think um, Bob Nelson's f- favorite idea is, it's perhaps radical, but it's to take inner-city neighborhoods which um, have been hurting for many years, which have not benefited from any policy initiative, uh, although they keep trying. You know, there are almost weekly um, emails that come from the Obama Department of Housing and Urban Development, perhaps you guys get them too, where there's some new initiative uh, to do things for in the way of housing, do things for inner city communities. Well, that now goes back to the war on poverty, and that hasn't done much at all. But, of course, people are going to, going to keep on trying. So Bob Nelson says, well, this stuff hasn't worked. So why don't we change state law? And why don't we change state law and allow the, the, the local citizens to vote on privatization, whereby they take over the public services and all that? So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting idea. Whether or not it will happen on a large scale, I have no idea. But keep in mind that the stuff that uh, Chamley writes, sorry, the kind of thing that she writes about and the kind of thing that people are doing without permission from City Hall, I think those are the interesting things, and I think they're going to get a lot more out of those initiatives than out of the things that get, get cranked out from the same old political process. I get the sense that um, the, the, the word... Um gated community has become so it's sort of so emotionally loaded and um, as you make the point Peter you know that the, the, it's there are a huge amount of uh, private uh, developments that are not gated yes. and I think I think that term has become the sort of almost like abuse term for a private development because it's sort of it, it, um, it evokes images of you know, people sort of turning their back on... on class the, warfare. Yeah, class warfare, exactly. Right. And, and, of course, it is true that um, in, in suburban areas that are highly dependent on state infrastructure, like highways, you do get some residential communities, I've seen them, which are gated, which do just have a big wall around them. And they are, I mean, in a sense, they are kind of parasitical on the cheap transport provided by through taxation provided um, you know for long distance long distance commuting however the term gated community i think is also used as a sort of general scare term to turn people off the idea that there could be such a thing as mm-hmm. a highly functioning private development oh sure yes i agree mm-hmm. i i want to say something about uh about highways um i you know, I, I really like cities. I think that in a free market, they would probably do better than suburbs. But I do have to admit that highways are not quite as subsidized as one would think. Um, I think that Randall O'Toole has probably done the best research on this. And, you know, when you measure the money goes in for the highway and then the money, you know, because what happens is the highway fund gets diverted to transit, but then there's also some oh, non-highway yes. fund money that gets diverted to highways. So when you do the, you know, the in and out, it's definitely true that transit is more subsidized than highways. I think the real problem is that all of the um, uh, the complementary goods to density to cities are you know more or less forbidden. I was talking about the elevated um, the elevated train lines. You know, back back around the turn of the century, elevated train lines were very profitable, um, and you could you know the, they wanted to expand them, but they they weren't allowed for you know 
uh, nuisance reasons. You know, they're kind of loud. Now they're a lot quieter. Um, so it sort of forced them underground or things like parking, you know, it, in, in the very core of old cities, the very, I'm talking about the very, very core, um, you know, you can get away with not building any parking, but anywhere else, you know, you sort of have to. So I would say that it's, it's less about the highway subsidies as the interventions in favor of the complements, you know, the, the economic term complement and substitute good, you know, like peanut butter and jelly, you know, they're, they're tied together in, intricately. Um, I would say that those are probably the bigger interventions than, you know, flat-out subsidies. So, that's it. Brian, I agree. Yeah. yeah, great point. 